evening. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Uh, wherever you're joining us from, please use the comments bar to tell us who you are, where you're joining us from this evening. We are here to launch and to celebrate the publication of this wonderful new book by Podrigo Tuma, his fourth book with uh, Canterbury Press, after two books of poetry and a book of daily prayer, he now brings us uh, a stunning reflection on a story, an ancient story from the Hebrew Bible uh, that resonates deeply in our own times, the story of Ruth, um, a migrant who uh, left her country after an experience of great loss and made a life among a new people and made a new life for them. And uh, in our own day, with our hardening public conversations about borders, belonging, who belongs, who doesn't, our identities, uh, our religious and political sense of who we are, this book has so much wisdom for, for our day. And many of you will know Paul Drake for his work in reconciliation over many, many years and he is a perfect voice to speak to us tonight on these themes. Uh, we welcome to a very special guest, uh, Bishop Gouli Francis de Carney, who brings a perspective that very few of us will have. She grew up in the Middle East and uh, she knows about the loss of a home country. Indeed, she has a forthcoming book called Cries from a Lost Homeland. Bishop Gooley is a suffragan bishop of Loughborough in the Diocese of Leicester, and in September becomes the Bishop of Chelmsford. And Bishop Gooley, we are delighted that you're able to join as a conversation partner uh, this evening. Uh, the shape of the evening will um, uh, Pordrig will tell us uh, how the book came into being. Pordrig and Bishop Gooley will then be in conversation for 15 minutes or so. Then we'll open it up to Q&A. So please post your questions uh, in the comments bar and we'll get as many of them as we can. And then to close the evening, uh, Bishop Gooley and Cordreg will will read um, uh, some passages from the book, their choices. Uh, so to begin our evening, we remember someone who isn't here uh, this evening, uh, Cordreg's co-author, Glenn, and Cordreg is now going to come and speak to us about his writing partner, Glenn, who sadly died as the manuscript was completed and submitted. So, Podrig, welcome, and uh, we look forward to hearing you. Uh, thanks very much, Christine, and thank you, everybody, for coming along to this launch of Borders and Belonging. Um, I've known Glenn since I was 11, and uh, he had been a dorm leader on a camp, um, a scripture union camp. Um, I was 11, he was 22. Um, I thought he was ancient, and I would regularly remind people that I'd known him since I was 11, and he'd always joke and say he was 12 when we met. Um, we both ended up moving to Belfast and ended up collaborating and being close friends um, over the course of a, a whole variety of projects. Glenn is one of those people who is loved by cities full of people so many friends in so many places around the world. He had so many deep loves and deep joys of life, you know, reading, conversation, rugby, um, Bruce Springsteen, theology. And so, so many people knew and loved Glenn deeply. And uh, everybody who knew and loved Glenn heard, I'd say within five minutes, him speak about his family, Adrian, his wife and his children, Christopher and Philippa. And um, they uh, knew the public Glen and also knew the private Glen of their deep and loving family. 
And so uh, he um, had degrees in theology and economics. He was widely read, a phenomenal Hebrew scholar, um, as well as a, what we would now call, I suppose, a public theologian, somebody who brought theology into conversation with the question about city planning, the question about law, the question about um, immigration policy, the question about peace and reconciliation, the question about Brexit, the question about race on the island of Ireland, the question about British-Irish relationships. Glenn was um, fascinated by public life and saw theology in profound conversation with public life. Um, a few years back, um, around the time, I suppose, 2015, when the Brexit referendum had been decided that it was going to happen, it hadn't happened yet, um, I was leading Corrymeela, which is Ireland's oldest peace and reconciliation centre. And I was um, anxious about how we could have conversations about Britishness and Irishness within the context of um, thinking about what was going to happen in Brexit. Um, I was aware that not for any ill will, but perhaps because of um, history curricula that for, that for a large part, huge amounts of the population of England may not know too much about quite how long British Irish history has gone on and quite how involved um, the government of Westminster or the Crown has been, and the Church of England, the Anglican Church, has been involved in terms of establishment on the island of Ireland and that Brexit was going to bring up 500 years of history. Probably in the room somebody is shouting 800 years. Um, and what we needed to do was to find a way where we could talk about Britishness and Irishness in a way with a story that could hold us. And um, I phoned Glenn up and asked him if he wanted to collaborate on a project where we would take the Book of Ruth and reflect on the Book of Ruth through the lens of borders and belonging and reflect on Britishness and Irishness um, through the lens of the Book of Ruth. We needed a story that could hold us and a story that wasn't just about establishing blame, but was a story about practicing what citizenship might be across contested borders, across ways within which people are viewed with suspicion and across what eventually turned out to be in increasingly anxiety-laden ways within which Britishness and Irishness and Europeanness were being discussed over the last number of years. Um, we held seminars over the course of about four years, I suppose. We met with 5,000 people um, across Ireland, both jurisdictions, and then England, Scotland and Wales as well. One group in Wales had the resource that we developed translated into Welsh, which was magnificent to have it in Welsh also. And we asked questions about ways within which families had stories of border crossing in them and what that experience of border crossing was like, what resentments were held, as well as what gratitudes were held. Um, in a context where questions about what Brexit would look like were increasingly and sometimes only being narrated through the lens of a, of a, of a trade deal, what we wanted to speak about is that Britishness and Irishness on the island of Ireland cannot only be reduced to the question of a trade deal. They have to be um, amplified to the question of what it means to share space, what it means to recognise the binding treaty of the Good Friday Agreement, and how we can have a gathering of language and policy and theology that holds us together, rather than barely stitches us together with the lowest common denominator of language. We needed things to lift the heart and challenge the heart as well as to challenge law, as well as to challenge language being used in public that was not paying attention to the impact of its own power. And we found that the Book of Ruth continually and continually and continually brought us into the question of that, which has been a magnificent thing. Um, we are, is there, there's a photograph um, that I can put up of me and Glenn, or um, this photograph was taken um, by Kaylee Reed, and with great thanks to Kaylee Reed. This is in my kitchen, actually. Um, Philippa Jordan, Glenn's daughter, um, wrote an article about Glenn and I on for Turf and Grain. You can search the article Turf and Grain. Um, and we, um, they, she did the interviews with us in my kitchen. I made some soup and we all sat around for a few hours. And um, then this is Glenn and I standing over in my kitchen. And uh, he, you can see he was a man um, at ease in himself and full of life. And it is with great grief and with great love that he is remembered by so many um, populations of people all over the place. I know there's people in the gathering tonight who knew him from all walks of life. Um, folks from his own church as well, from Ballycrock and Presbyterian Church and family members too.
And so we remember him with great love. And part of the great love of remembering Glenn is his um, theological imagination. Um, I would recommend if you're thinking you don't have time to read the whole book, just read his chapters, chapter one, three, five and seven. And um, that's all you'll need in the book. I'm just telling stories and writing poems. But um, his work is quite extraordinary in terms of the theological dexterity and imagination and scholarship that he brings to the text. Um, I'm going to invite Bishop Gooley in for a conversation now. Um, I think the, our colleagues at Canterbury Press are going to bring you up. Bishop Gooley, thanks very much for taking the time. I know you're right in the midst of moving from being, uh, you know, a bishop in the Diocese of Leicester to moving to the Diocese of Chelmsford. And in the middle of all this, you've taken time to read this text, um, as well as to take time to be with us this evening. So first of all, thank you very much for taking time to do this. I really appreciate um, your attention and your kindness. Thank you very much, Padraig. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, I've loved reading the book. It, you kindly said exactly the same to me as you've just said, you know, just read Glenn's chapters uh, and Glenn's chapters are superb, but I couldn't put the book down. And, uh, you know, once I'd started it, there was no way I was only going to read um, part of it. Uh, so, yeah, thank you so much for, for inviting me to be part of this conversation. Um, the subtitle of this book is, you know, a book of the Book of Ruth, a story for our time. Um, what strikes you about the book? Are there any particular things that struck you? Yeah, I mean, there's there's so much that's uh, striking about the book. Uh, perhaps first and foremost, um, it's a book of hope um, uh, in a in a time of many challenges, and that was true when the story is set uh, at the time of the judges and the time of famine and so on. So a lot of kind of um, hardship and brutality and violence. Uh, and then the, the story of Ruth cuts into that uh, with a kind of ray of light and a sense of deep hope, um, which speaks, of course, I, I don't need to spell it out, speaks absolutely um, to our time. Um, and there's something very, uh, there's always something really impactful, I think, with books that can, uh, and, and this is true particularly of Ruth, that uh, tell a very personal story, that draw you into the lives of a handful of individuals, but at the same time articulate something about the human story. Uh, and of course, you, you say in the book somewhere that these two women, Ruth and Naomi, stand for two nations. Um, and in that way, we, we kind of watch them cross their own individual borders, but the impact that it has on, on the wider people and so on. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's very true for us today, you know, how scripture um, is relevant, not just or has the potential to be relevant, not just um, in our individual one to one relationships, but potentially uh, in the retelling uh, of the stories of nations, as you've tried to, to set it within the, the context of Britain and Ireland, but, you know, potentially uh, so many other cross national um, uh, stories could be retold as well. So, yeah, lots of hope um, and lots of uh, uh, a, a sense of if we engage with it, we can be changed through it in the way that, of course, Ruth and Naomi were and the people that they were part of. Yeah. Um, I'd like to talk to you about borders and a question about a theology and policy of borders. But, you know, your own story is so filled with um, border crossings. You know, you were born in Isfahan in Iran and then came um, out of need to Britain um, and sought safety there. And um, throughout your whole life, really, in your professional life, you have been concerned with questions about the borders we cross and the borders we bring with ourselves and the borders that are established between populations who might share a city or share a region. What is it about borders in your life, when, given the fact that borders have been so um, dangerous in your life, as well as you have been so publicly aware of speaking wisely about borders? What do you, what, when you think of border, what comes to your mind now? Oh. <sighs> Yeah, it's it's just such a fascinating fascinating subject. When I when I think of borders now, I think of uh, places that are actually rich and full of potential. Um, you know, but borders can be uh, such negative uh, forces, can't they? But they have the potential uh, to be anything but. And uh, you know, my sense is that we we do need borders. I, I don't think borders are necessarily a bad thing. Uh, I think we need borders to give us a sense of um, 
you know, who we are and and belonging and kind of setting some perimeters, if you like, uh, that set us on our way. Um, I, I can't imagine a world without any borders uh, because it would just all be chaotic. Um, but the, the crossing of those borders doesn't need to be something negative or, or frightening, but it opens up a whole new vista and a whole new um, way of seeing the world and also seeing yourself, because not only are you presented with, with a new landscape to look on and learn from, but you discover new things about yourself as you cross the borders as well. So I, I think we all you know, we all cross borders in our lives all of the time. It's just that some of us um, who've moved countries or who've been involved in, in cross-cultural um, conversations more perhaps are, are aware of it a, a little bit more. And I, and I also think that there's something fascinating about um, the borders that we set up ourselves, you know, the invisible borders, as it were, the fault lines um, that we put in place either to exclude people um, or indeed to, to enrich conversation. So borders are a bit a bit like money. They're, then they're not good or bad in themselves. They have the potential uh, to be full of richness and positivity, but they also have the potential to become walls uh, that we use to keep one another out. Yeah. So often, and I think Glenn says this a lot in the book, the question about border is the question about how safe is it to cross and for whom is it safe? Are they armed? Are there are there rules of integration when you cross over? Are those rules careful and safe and communicated or are they set up as traps? And often we hear, um, and this occurs in the Book of Ruth too, the question about the good immigrant, the good border crosser, and what, what does it mean to be a good border crosser? And that's a critique you can make of the Book of Ruth, because, you know, when Boaz sees her and says, who is she? You know, some of the workers in the field that Boaz owns says, oh, she's the woman who came and she's been good to her mother-in-law, Naomi. And so you can see in a certain sense that there is this idea that Ruth um, was a good border crosser. And I think it's really worthwhile pushing that and thinking what are the ways within which um, narratives are put on to people about being a good immigrant these days and upon whom is that put? Do you know, um, there can be, you know, for instance, people who come from places that were under the British Empire. When they come to Britain, there can be an imagination that they have to be a good border crosser when... <laughs> When the British Empire went there, the British Empire wasn't a good border crosser. Uh, and so who gets to decide the rules as to who should fit in with whom in the context of that? Where do you notice that in contemporary Ireland and Britain today in terms of this, um, these rules that occur and are spoken and unspoken and that are imposed on people when they cross a border? Mm. Yeah, um, all the time we do it, don't we? And we impose it, I think, on ourselves as well. Uh, you know, um, the desire to be the the, the good immigrant and uh, the the person. I, again, I, I think there's something about the need uh, to feel that one can contribute to one's new society, as it were, um, which in itself creates a sense of belonging. Um, so I think it's one thing to receive hospitality and generosity. Um, those are wonderful things, and I've experienced uh, a, a lot of it. Um, but there's something about wanting to contribute and give back from who I really am uh, in order to feel that I find my place of belonging. And um, it's interesting because I, I think, I don't know that that I'm so profoundly aware of it in crossing national boundaries, but I'm certainly aware of it crossing church boundaries, if I can put it like that. Um, so I, I have felt very much a pull to kind of conform within the context of the Church of England and to behave and to be someone that the institution of the Church of England can, can kind of accept, as it were. And I've had to learn, I've had to um, to really push myself to feel that I can find my own voice and to take into the institution of the Church of England something of a tiny community in a far-flung part of the Anglican Communion in Iran, where I come from. And it, it feels really quite profound to me that um, now that I'm a bishop, in a sense, uh, 
I, I've taken right into the heart of the institution um, something about the, the persecuted church so, so that the, the marginal has been pulled right into the center, if you like. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm aware of that for good or, or ill. Um, and I've just learned over the, over the years that I just have to try and find a way of being true to myself whilst wanting to be part of a conversation, a respectful conversation. Um, uh, yeah, and I, on it goes. It's, a, yeah. it's an ongoing conversation. You grew up bilingually, didn't you? Yes, that's right. Yeah. I'm so, you know, I'm, I'm so, I, I love talking to other bilingual people or trilingual people. There's so many people who speak so many languages. Um, and I think that speaking plural languages isn't only something when there's a formal difference, you know, between the languages you speak, you know, Farsi, Irish, English, French, whatever. But we often find ways to, to be bilingual across different structures of power that we're in too, aren't we? And there's a way within which we need to find a way to represent a language that we might be tempted to quieten when we're in a situation where we might be being quietly asked to assimilate. But nonetheless, I think the, the call of integrity is to speak up. Um, yeah, that that yeah. takes a personal yeah. toll. And, and crossing, um, you know, uh, Crossing languages is is a whole border crossing of its own, isn't it? And it, it's about so much more than just the words. It's about the cultural framework in which the words are set and what they mean within that cultural context, yeah. um, which can be completely different things in England, as in Ireland, as in America. You know, these countries that speak the same language, um, the, the the cultural framework means that the same words can can have very carry very different meanings, and yeah. and I've. I've learned a bit of that. I'm, I'm married to um, uh, a Northern Irishman. So uh, Ireland has kind of become, <laughs> has kind of embraced me and become a, a second home to me. And it's it, it's been fascinating. There are lots of similarities between the Irish and the Persians, I've decided, or Iranians, um, which we, you know, maybe we'll talk about another time, but- um, No, no, give us a few now, I wanna hear them. Well, <laughs> this is too good to for you. Unable to go back to to my own homeland, it's been really important to me actually to um, to to make a home. I mean, we we only come on holiday to Ireland, but I I love Ireland and the people are are fascinating. I I, I you know, please forgive me if if I'm treading all over all kinds of sensitivities, but you're forgiven the, already. Yeah. <laughs> some of the similarities are, I, I think, um, a real uh, interpersonal warmth welcome hospitality generosity um people just you know welcome you into their uh, homes and and food is so central and all of those things and yet there's something on a national level uh, where we we kind of struggle um we're suspicious of of one another and we we struggle to um to 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 live across the the big picture in ways that aren't very diversive and and lots of suspicion and a kind of an inability to live well together um, alongside this paradox where there's huge amounts of, of warmth and and um, hospitality yeah somehow even though I can't feel it I can feel an audience especially all those from the north of Ireland going my God, yes, you've put your finger on it, that there is this mixture of hospitality and hostility, which isn't a, a personally chosen hostility. It is having been in a place that has no known centuries of serious questions about where are we? Is this UK or Ireland? What's going on? And the, the question about borders does bring an impact into the way within which people um, communicate in public. And some of that, you know, the certain certain kind of anxiety about having to talk about national issues there is a quiet hospitality in that because people don't want to offend each other um, over and over again while we did this project glenn and i because we worked in churches all around the place adrian and glenn were driving to all kinds of places crossing the border down to monaghan up to Derry, you know over to donegal and um, having conversations with groups and churches saying let's talk away about ways within which britishness and irishness is in your family let's talk about the ways within which um, religious border crossing has happened where somebody will have a methodist auntie that nobody quite talks about or a catholic grandmother that 
that nobody re refers to because she kept her Catholicism quiet and that might only be discovered after her death, for instance, when maybe a dying wish was that rosary beads would be placed in her hand while she had while she was being buried. And suddenly this whole story comes out about a border crossing there that there had been generations of silence and complicity tied in. And we found ways in which people were anxious to talk about that, not because they were going to say something um, derogatory, but because they hadn't been used to speaking about it because there has been such a level of silence in so many places. And that one of the opportunities about using the Book of Ruth was to open that up so that people could feel like, oh yeah, we are allowed to talk about this, talk about some of the resentments, as well as talk about some of the ways within which border crossing has been part of so many of our lives. And to challenge each other as well. You know, we had a, a great, um, I suppose, what would you call it, um, argument maybe in some of the events we did in Dublin, you know, where some of the some of the people from England who had moved over were learning things about English history as it involved Ireland that they hadn't known before. Um, and then some of the people who hadn't ever left Ireland were being challenged in terms of the story of Ireland that they told that, that too closely tied Catholicism with Irishness. And they were being challenged to say, well, that there can be a more generous narrative of the religious landscape of Ireland that doesn't only that isn't only synonymous with Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And I suppose there's a there's an invitation to a radical generosity and gratitude giving that seemed to be so important. Have you yeah. found this in terms of um, the, the radical nature of storytelling as well as questions to do with um, gratitude and not allowing uh, an anxious political climate to dictate the final way that we speak about each other cross border? Is that something that you seek to do in the diocese that you lead and, or, and the ministries that you're involved with? Yeah, I think in the end, stories are an incredibly powerful way of saying things that we couldn't otherwise say, or, or at least finding ways of understanding one another. I, I think people connect deeply through the telling of stories. And I've I've had that said to me over and over again. I, you know, I, I talk very openly and uh, and I hope uh, honestly about my own story, but I, I share it not so much just because it's my story and I want to share it, but I share it in order to make connections. Um, and I've, I've, you know, I've spoken a lot and I've thought a lot about the whole thing of identity and how we find our belonging and what home is and, and so on and so forth. And I've discovered over the years that actually um, these are themes that are common to many people. Um, and for all kinds of reasons, people feel they don't belong or they haven't made peace with their past or, or they're anxious that somehow their past is is defining their present and and kind of uh, setting their, their their future for them in a way that they don't want so these are human themes I think I, I don't think they're peculiar to, to me or to a handful of other people um, and stories make the connections uh, in, in a way that um, you know, dry prose, if I can put it like that, wouldn't. And, and and I think that's one of the things that comes across in this book is, you know, it's very much yours and Glenn's voice. And I, I'm just so, so sad never to have had the opportunity to meet Glenn. Um, very much your own voices, but infused with the voices of all these other hundreds of people that you engaged with in the, in the writing of the book. Uh, and that's there at a, at a kind of subliminal level all the way through and I think adds to its um, potency if I can if I can put it like that um, it's yeah. infused the stories of many many people in the telling it's beautiful yeah thanks we're going to have some Q&A and I think Christine or Josie are going to bring some people up but while people might want to write things into the Q&A I suppose it's worthwhile talking about the methodology of the book which I suppose you would call a certain public or maybe even a community theology which was where we'd take these texts and we'd meet with different groups of people and have some conversations, but then we'd have questions. And Glenn was famous for these yellow notebooks. I'm sure there must be so many of them around his house. Some of them not even started, some of them with two pages used, some of them with barely an inch left in them. Um, and he was always writing in them. And when he was facilitating the conversation, he'd give me the notebook and I'd write in them just quotes from people. And our reading of the text, him and I, was changed by the readings that we heard in different places. Mm -hmm. Um, doing readings in Scotland, in England, in Wales, doing readings all across the all across the island of Ireland, doing readings with populations of people who are not interested in religion, but we're happy to use a narrative to speak about border crossing. This um, 
profoundly changed the way that he and I read the text, as well as then doing readings in conversation with Jewish scholars and in conversation with uh, Midrash and wanting to make sure that while we are two white Irishmen talking about a story of Moabite and um, Israeli uh, women, particularly through the story of Naomi and Ruth, um, we nonetheless wanted to be um, respectful and not do any harm and do uh, do a, an act of gratitude to um, the Jewish community from whom the story comes and to whom the story belongs. So, thank you. Are there questions that are coming in? Oh, they're coming in, they certainly are. Uh, thank you both very, very much. That was a wonderful conversation. And just to tell everybody that you can listen to that again. Uh, the link will keep on working. This is being recorded. And so if you want to, uh, I, I filled two or three pages with notes. Um, <laughs> I know I didn't get it all and I want to go back. So you can watch this as many times as you like. Um, we have got some great questions, but before we turn to those, can, can I ask what came first, um, Padre? Did the Book of Ruth come first or the set of questions that made you go looking in scripture for a way to engage with them? Um, Brexit came first, quite honestly. <laughs> <laughs> There's no point today but trying to find a politer way about it. And not just the vote, the preemption to the vote. Because to my yeah. mind, what was what was really clear is that even preemptively, there were serious questions about what does Englishness mean? What does what's the relationship of Englishness to, to Britishness? What does the population on the island of Britain know about the history of Britain and its involvement in Ireland, mm -hmm. as well as the the impact of the Good Friday Agreement. Similarly, what about uh, you know the awareness about a, a referendum being used in a parliamentary democracy? That's not a usual combination, and those were all going to have phenomenal impacts on the island of Ireland. That you know the the pamphlet that was sent around in advance of Brexit, and I know good people voted in different ways, but the pamphlet that was sent around about Brexit didn't mention. Uh, the north of Ireland once and we have seen over the last four years about how unwise that was that there wasn't preemptive conversations in advance that would have meant that there would have been a document to have studied to have voted in um, and pe good, uh, good people voted in different ways that's really important to say and uh, across all of our gatherings different people had voted in different ways but what was really clear was that there was lots of people who were saying we didn't think about Ireland when it came to this. And that wasn't for any callousness. It was because there was other concerns that were on their mind. But the Irishness question has come in very definitely, as we know now <laughs> for the last four years. You probably heard too much about Ireland in the last four years. Um, but everybody here knew that that was going to have to be the situation. And so it was that crisis actually was the thing that started off to say we need to find a new way to speak about Britishness and Irishness. There was political consultations happening, community consultations being led by the Dublin government. And we wrote to the Dublin government, Glenn and I, to say you're doing really, really good community work. But the largest club in the country, if you want to talk about it crudely like that, is the Club of Faith. Um, and the Sunday morning gatherings, um, the population of Ireland, North and South, has a very high population of church attendance. And we were saying this is the largest gathering of people in a membership organization on the island of Ireland. We can help you put together some resources. And mm -hmm. we asked them, I can't remember, for 14 grand to, supp to support the salary throughout that. And they immediately gave us more. And then the Henry Luce Foundation in the States and the Northern Ireland Community Relations Council also gave some money to support all of these projects. So it was the crisis really that was making us wonder what's going to happen to the border, what's going to happen to public conversations about Britishness and Irishness that made us go, we need to find a story that can help steady us. Not to say how you should or shouldn't vote or have voted, but to say here's what the practice of community looks like if you're thinking of practicing that through the lens of faith. Mm. It's astonishing. Um, I, read the, I read the story of Ruth last night. It's, it's not even three pages in the Bible. Yeah, um, tiny. And yet, and, yet, and, and God is not, is, is not in there. God no. is not during that drama at all. No. Um, you know, there's so much kind of self-determination uh, through which God acts. It's just extraordinary. Well, let's turn to some of these questions. And I'm going to go to one that's come in um, uh, one of the last, but we'll go back to the earlier ones, is from Angela Savory, and it picks up 
Podrick, on what you're saying um, about where we are now, Angela Savory, how best, as an English person, can one be a good ally to the people of Ireland in what has been agreed in the Good Friday Agreement as it collides? That's uh, an interesting verb uh, with Brexit, whose existence saddens my heart. Angela, you're not on your own. Um, I, first of all, I think reading the Good Friday Agreement is a really good practice <laughs> you know, as you look at the ways within which um, uh, Britishness and Irishness have, Irishness have been narrated through um, uh, political language and language about trade deals and language about backstops and all of those kinds of things over the last few years. When you read the Good Friday Agreement, you see, oh, this is what's possible in light of a place that has known hundreds of years of tension about the Britishness and or Irishness of the place. When you read the Good Friday Agreement, which is by no means a perfect peace agreement, but it is pretty extraordinary. When it speaks about in a spirit of concord, we come together. When it says really clearly that no government has sovereignty over the question of Irishness in the North or the South. When it says that sovereignty about the island of Ireland belongs to the people of Ireland. When you realize this is what is capable in public and political language, I think that is a magnificent standard to which to hold our politicians to say, whatever you're doing here, make it as good as the Good Friday Agreement in terms of the tone of dignity of Britishness and Irishness mm -hmm. that's narrated in that. And I think that can be a really good um, step. Mm -hmm. And thank you for the question, Angela. And I mean, I think that, that that is possible for people who voted in any kind of a way, whether they voted one way or another or chose not to vote in the question of Brexit. I don't assume that people are against Irishness, depending as to whether they did or didn't vote or in whatever way they did. I think people had all kinds of valid concerns going on at their heart when it came to Brexit. Uh, an unfortunate impact of all of that, I think, has been ways within which the question here in the north of Ireland, and I'm right on the border, the borders, you know, a couple of fields that way, um, uh, that that has had a, a detrimental impact, partly because it's shown us that um, very few people have read um, the Good Friday Agreement apart from us here. Um, but yet it involves Britishness as well. Um, we don't talk about the Irish border here because it's not an Irish border. The Irish border is the sea. We talk about the British border in Ireland. And so I think there's a way within which the two islands need to be involved here in, in paying attention to the seriousness of the Good Friday Agreement. Thank you. And Podrick, your, your response illustrates the power of language. Um, and our responsibility to handle language well. Um, I'm going to group a couple of comments here because I think they're all saying the same thing. And um, maybe Bishop Gooley, we could come to you first with this. Bally Crocken Presbyterian Church, which is Glenn's church. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. A wonderful a couple people. Of comments, a couple of comments from them. Borders can be an opportunity to provide a welcome to the visitor and hope to the hopeless. Uh, and also to share something new in a new place, as Ruth did. And I think what um, what's at the heart of that uh, is expressed well by Will Childs. Borders, edges are where life begins and flourish, flourishes, if hospitality and belonging is there. I think what those things together say is that the kind of recipient cultures have responsibilities too. It's not just about being a good immigrant. Um, how do we, how do the hosts become good hosts? Bishop Gula, mm -hmm. you've encountered some hosts, good and bad, I imagine, mm -hmm. uh, along your journey. What, what would you say in response to that? Well, one, one of the things I think I've uh, thought increasingly about is um, that we're quite good, particularly uh, in the church and within the context of, of our faith, talking about the need for hospitality and generosity to the stranger. Um, and all of that is, of course, absolutely true. Um, but I think what can be more, even more impactful um, is to be willing as the um, as the recipient, as it were, um, to become a guest um, to the outsider, if you see what I mean. So not just to be the person who is giving generosity and 
giving space and um, welcome and so on, but to actually be the one that enters into the space of the visitor and becomes a guest. Uh, and that comes back to this thing of, of allowing the, the, um, the visitor to be the one who's contributing, allow the visitor to be the one who becomes host, as it were. And that becomes a real meeting place because it becomes a meeting place of equals uh, rather than the, the host being the one that has something to offer, which the immigrant then has to kind of graciously receive. Um, so I, I think there's something uh, that's much more mutual in that it's not to say that hospitality and generosity aren't important of course they are um but it's it, it's yeah there's something more mutual in the space that's created when we're both guest mm -hmm. and host uh, and then there's also something i think about um the willingness to to give when we do give uh, and give generously to actually give of our best um, and not just the kind of dregs, you know, the the the, the stuff that we, we we don't have any need of ourselves. I sometimes tell this this story to illustrate this. And when we were fairly new in England, having arrived as as refugees, we we were shown a huge amount of generosity, uh, you know. And I, I don't want to speak ill of anyone, but um, there was one particular incident where um, somebody brought round a kind of box of stuff as my parents were trying to set up new home um, that might be useful to them from the kitchen that they'd, they'd kind of emptied their drawers and, and brought stuff that might be useful. And that later that evening, um, my, my mother and I were in the kitchen and she was peeling potatoes with a potato peeler that had been brought by this person in, a, in amongst their stuff. Um, but it was blunt. It didn't work. And she couldn't peel the potatoes. And, and my mother was a very, very gentle person. And she just, I can still remember her very gently just wondering what this person thought might be useful in giving a blunt potato peeler to somebody else. So something about, you know, how, how do we give? What do we mean by generosity? It's not just giving, it's giving of our best, um, which, yeah, is all part of the, um, part of the experience of both being generous and receiving. Mm. I'm not sure I've ever said this to you, Bishop Gulley. We haven't known each other for very long, but I visited your parents' home a couple of times. And I have to say their hospitality was the most extraordinarily generous I have ever received in more than 30 years in religious publishing. You know, there was no assumption that the editor would take them out for lunch. It was, uh, it was just extraordinary always. And they modeled, um, they modeled that quality that you just mentioned. Podrick, do you want to add anything to that? One of the things I think that the Book of Ruth does is it turns the question about host and guest on its head mm. over and over again. It isn't about Ruth being given um, pity. She has to assert that she's worthy of what she has a right to because she was married to a Bethlehem citizen and she was a widow of a Bethlehem citizen. So therefore she was entitled to social welfare. But because she was Moabite and they were not loved, there was a question to say, yeah, but is that marriage valid? Because they lived there and they've come back here. So there was a way within which there was questions as to whether she was, whether her marriage was valid enough to be recognized as her having a right to social welfare, as well as her having a right to be married into the, you know, through Leverett law to a kinsperson of her dead husband. And so one of the things that Ruth is doing is Ruth doesn't receive generosity or um, even charity and certainly not pity. What she is doing is she's asserting a way within which a community needs to be its best self. And so far from, mm -hmm demean a community by an outsider coming in and often that can be the fantasy you see that over and over again in ireland at the moment ways within which people are saying you know irish jobs for irish people etc um and there's the imagination that foreigners um are going to be demeaning the experience of irishness what the book of ruth does is to say foreigners return the local host community to their own deepest practice and that is the audacity of the book is that it is showing that actually ruth is the experience in her own personhood and in her own presence and in her own being and her, her own body she is the person who challenges the host community to be their own best selves um, and that mm -hmm. is a an exhausting 
um, role that she carries and she does it in quite an extraordinary way. I often wonder what nurtured her? Where did she get that mm. fortitude? Do you know, who was she? I just think she's an extraordinary character. And in that way, I think we see a theological ethic that goes beyond being nice to somebody and actually asks us to pay attention to our resistances and read our resistances in the light of somebody who is sometimes challenging us about where the edges of our hospitality are. Indeed. Thank you. I think that answers a couple of other questions. Um, there's so many coming in, I'm not sure we're going to get to them all. Uh, there was one about um, uh, the board, the, the borders of class, especially within the Church of England, which is so often to be assumed, you know, thinks of itself as kind of middle class. And I think what you said there, Podrig, um, who was, was that from? Gareth Blindfish. Um, I, I think, I, I think, Gareth, yes. I think your comments there uh, answer Gareth's concerns. Um, we can't develop that one further now because we have we uh, there's so many coming in uh, who dave green says question why the book of ruth when the whole story of israel was about borders crossing of borders then owning the land which is given jewish nation being enslaved and then taken into captivity that's a good question why what is it about the book of ruth that drew you <coughs> Well, partly it's so short. <laughs> it was, it was, you know, it, when you're when you're a group facilitator, you're thinking we're going to do this in sessions of about an hour, and some people will only come to one hour, some people will come to four, um, and so uh, you're, Dave's totally right. There are so many narratives that we could have chosen, but this one is a self-contained one and is so interesting and narrates a question about citizenship and law and change. And it ultimately asks, how do you read your own religious law? What lens do you use to interpret the law? Do you think that the law exists objectively or can you understand that your reading of the law can be influenced by the experience of border crossing and having a border crosser among you? Um, it just seemed to embody it perfectly through the story of these widowed, displaced border crossers. There was something too about the narrative of famine that you find in the book that felt so appropriate for a story of Irishness and Britishness that we were going to be looking at given relatively recently in historical terms, the famine in Ireland and the and the the way within which the population of Ireland has not even still recovered to the level that it was pre famine, the only country in Europe that whose population is less now than it was in the 1840s. Wow. Wow. Um, a, a different question uh, from Ray Wynn. How do we as Christians explore the tension between the sense of identity and belonging that we feel linked to place and the biblical image of us as sojourners and strangers here mm. on the Bishop, Bishop Gooley, would you like to? Your face is lit up in a smile. I think you've got some very wise thoughts on this. I don't have any wise thought, but I think it's a great question. And um, it's one of those paradoxes, isn't it, of, um, of faith and and I think faith is made up of many paradoxes uh, at least it is it is for me and and the the um again the rich interesting places are often right in the borders between the two sides of the paradox um and, and it's absolutely that it's the same as as the incarnation isn't it that that God um became flesh in a particular time and in a particular place and, and took on the identity of a particular person. And, you know, those things matter and they give us a sense of um, uh, belonging and identity and home and relationships. Uh, all of those things are important um, and are full of possibility uh, until we treat them as idols. Um, if I can put it like that, and, until they become things that define us um, in such um, uh, harsh and inflexible ways uh, that they prevent us from connecting well with others. So I, I've, you know, I, I've, I've sought to understand my own identity better and better as I've got older, uh, but not in order to place me in opposition to others. Um, and, and kind of put greater distance, but as a means of knowing myself so that I can then enter into the conversation um, uh, and, and learn from it and contribute to it. 
Um, so in the same way as we're, we're citizens of, of heaven, uh, as ultimately we're, we're, you know, leaning towards our home beyond life and in, in God's company. Um, but we're also in the in the here and now and we're seeking to create a bit of that kingdom here and now. Uh, hence the fact that we want to to build communities that reflect something of um, the, the ethos of God's kingdom. So it's constantly a push pull and the hope is what keeps us leaning forward. Um, but the, the, the task is also to create that um, sense of belonging in the here and now. We all have to do that individually, I think, as well as as, as communities. Thank you. Podrick, do you want to add to that? And I think we'll take one, at Two questions together next, and then we'll we'll think about drawing this. Um, I, I think at the heart of that question, or one of the things at the heart of that question, because it is, first of all, to say it's a beautiful question. And I think living into that question, as Rilke would say, um, is a wise thing to do. So thank you for the question. Um, one of the things that's at the heart of that is the question of continuity and change. And if you take, for instance, the United Kingdom, over the last few hundred years, the United Kingdom has changed um, radically every hundred years. So 100 years ago, it became the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, a hundred, you know, with the partition of Ireland. The hundred years previous to that, there had been an act of union called, making this thing called the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. A hundred years previous to that, there had been the, you know, the act of union regarding England and Scotland. And so what we see is that this thing called the United Kingdom has sought um, narratives of continuity in the midst of um, really measurable change. And I think that's always going to be a question for individuals and in situations of um, political belonging. It is to ask what narratives of continuity are, as well as recognize that every narrative of so-called continuity has been filled with significant and serious and fundamental change over and over again in terms of policy and people. I suppose the question of faith or any form of ethical belonging or moral imagination is to think in the midst of political change, what do I hold on to as a thread for giving a sense of belonging and identity that is of virtue? Questions to do with belonging, questions to do with the practice of hospitality, questions to do with learning, questions to do also with imagination and art and protest too when it comes to thinking this recent change has actually done people out of their rights. And I suppose those are the ways within which we hold the tension, as Ray Wynne said it so wisely, the tension of holding um, what continuity and change can be like and ways within which at times we'll emphasize one or at times emphasize the other, but knowing that inevitably all of our lives are caught up in the story of that, as was the story of, of Ruth and Naomi. They were caught up in this tension of continuity and change. And what they did was in the middle of that, they were authors of their own agency and they helped to provide to the community a way within which they could interpret the story of their law through the lens of widowed displaced border crossers that enhanced the experience for all. Mm. Thank you. Now, I'm going to, uh, we're not going to get to be able to get to all the questions. They're so interesting. But there are two which um, have a kind of practical dimension to them because I think any event like this leaves us asking, what, what can I do better? What can I do? What can I do to start um, to be better? So, uh, Anya Becker, uh, that was one of the very first questions that came in, asks, what practices have you found helpful in encouraging others and yourself to be willing to cross borders, maybe more often an issue socioeconomically than nationally, and, and, and also one by Amy Chatelaine. I think we could take these two together. Um, how can we construct stroked, stroke tend borders in a way that actually facilitates encounter rather than division? So I, you know, both of those questions about our own behaviors hmm. at, at the border. Yeah. What, what wisdom can you share with us? Well, I uh, Corimila, with whom I've been associated for a long time, I led Corimila from 2014 to 2019, and I'm still a member. Um, Corimila is one of the organisations, and it is only one of them. There are many organisations of goodwill in the north of Ireland, as well as all across Britain and Ireland, um, 
who are saying, let's take um, the stories we tell about ourselves and examine them through the experience of somebody who might have a challenging or a different story. Um, let's take an imagination about the experience of Catholicism, for instance, and hear about the sharp edge of Catholicism through people whose lives have been deeply wounded by having been wounded by the Catholic Church. And let's find a way where we're not only telling ourselves the story of ourselves that comforts us, but actually hearing some of the sharp edges of that. And I think every community, every diocese, every place all around Britain and Ireland, there are dioceses and community organizations and retreat centers of great will doing projects where they're saying let's bring unexpected conversation partners together so that people who think there's only one story about here might be in the slightly awkward but ultimately enlightening experience of hearing their story narrated through a different point of view and mm -hmm. that i think is always going to be slightly awkward but that's okay. Slightly awkward can be really good. Um, it's never persecutory. You're not going to be put out of your home or threatened or those kinds of things. What you are going to be is um, asked perhaps to expand the, the borders of your own tent of imagination. And that, I think, is ultimately a great um, endeavor and is usually done with extraordinary gratitude. And so I suppose in response to the, the questions, um, it is a question to say that finding a community locally who are committed to saying what are the edges of the stories we tell about ourselves, and what are ways we can engage with um, considering are the borders of our community are the borders of our belongings are those are those hostile do they come with deeply entrenched demands for people who cross over those borders are they threatening even though we don't think they're threatening i might say oh we're totally easy to join but another person might go under no circumstance it's deeply embarrassing to be in your presence because of some of the things you assume about me that I automatically have to name to highlight myself as somehow different. Mm -hmm. And to do that, again, it's awkward, but I ultimately think that's one of the ethics of the imagination of the Hebrew Bible. And um, the book of Ruth is read at the same time during the Hebrew fest, the Jewish festival of Pentecost, Shavuot, and they read the giving of the law to Moses on the top of the mountain, and they read the entirety of the book of Ruth all in the same liturgy, which is, say, which is to say that the big story we tell about ourselves in terms of God coming down with language from the top of a mountain through the body of Moses, that that can only be held if we are willing to interpret it through the lens of a widowed, displaced border crosser from a place we're in enmity with. That is awkward for sure, but ultimately brilliant because it expands the imagination. Fabulous answer. Um, Bishop Gulley, as a bishop, you're going to have to do some of that stuff, aren't you, I imagine? Bring human stories together and, uh, you know, the big story of God. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've spoken in terms of, you know, moving to Chelmsford and starting by trying to be someone that gathers the stories uh, and gets to know the place through the stories. Um, and I think... Um, you know, we do need to have our stories challenged. It's not that not that everything needs to go unchallenged, but I think we kid ourselves if we don't all recognise that we read scripture and understand that big story, as as Padre has said, of of um, God amongst us uh, through the lenses of our own stories. And so, the more we do that alongside others, um, the better we we both understand our own perspectives, but also we see that there are diverse effect, um, perspectives as well. And, and so reading scripture alongside other people is, is, you know, fascinating. I mean, that's essentially what you've done, of course, in this book, but there are all kinds of different ways of doing that. Uh, it's a form of border crossing you know, the different perspectives with which we come to scripture. And, you know, there's a there's there's a whole sense, I think, amongst a whole lot of people, certainly in this in this country, in England, that that scripture is read objectively. Um, uh, and uh, I think because that's the normative experience, uh, there hasn't been time given over uh, to recognizing the, the subjective stories that we bring to it. And and I think the the you know, the idea of crossing borders, whether it's in our understanding of scripture or in one another's stories or so on, um, you have to want to do it. You have to be intentional 
about it. I don't think crossing borders comes particularly naturally to any of us. I think as the human instinct is to search out people like ourselves mm -hmm. and then stay safe within those echo chambers. Um, so you have to want to step out of that. Um, I think Pope Francis referred to developing a culture of encounter where, where you where you physically have to kind of pick up one foot and put it in front of the other to, to move across um, boundaries and, and borders. So you have to want to do it and you have to be open both to sharing your own story honestly, but also having it critiqued through the stories of others. Um, that that's you know that's the way our, our insight develops. We have to allow it to be open. Uh, otherwise we just become defensive. Well, there is an immense challenge for us all. Um, these hours always go far too quickly and um, it's, it's almost eight o'clock, so we're going to come to our final part of the programme now where, uh, first of all, Bishop Cooley is going to read her selected passage from uh, the book and then Pordrig will read his. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so I've um, I've chosen a passage towards the end of the book. It's in it's in one of the chapters written by Glenn. Um, and uh, this is after um, the unnamed relative who has a first claim, if you like, on marrying Ruth, has uh, turned down the offer of marrying her uh, by sticking to the, the kind of firm interpretation of the law of Moses not to allow a Moabite into the mix of the people of God. Uh, and Boaz has then revealed his intention to marry Ruth, not only to marry her, but to have children with her. And the community, everyone has enthusiastically agreed. And, and this passage follows on from that. We shouldn't move too quickly past this moment, for what is happening here is remarkable. Boaz has placed before the people a clear moment of transformation and they have accepted it. The choice they faced was to hold tightly to the tradition of Moses laid out in the law in Deuteronomy and refuse to admit Ruth to the community. The law is clear and unequivocal on this matter. But in this time and in these circumstances, and for this woman, the application of the law would have resulted in an unkindness or ungrace. Knowing her character and kindness, the people agreed that this particular law had come to the end of its useful life. And so they take to themselves the right and even, I would argue, the obligation to change the law and the tradition so that kindness and grace is extended. Pause here for a moment. In this apparently simple story, we're presented with an extraordinary example of how the Bible works. This seems to me to be an example of the Bible reinterpreting itself and its tradition for new circumstances. There was a time perhaps when the existence of a good Moabite was impossible to imagine, but times change. And with that, the application of the law. There was a time when belonging could only be determined by blood. Those considered as kin were people who looked exactly like us and spoke and behaved exactly like us. But times change, and with that the application of the law. And those changes are always in the direction of kindness and grace. We will always wrestle with the temptation to define belonging through an application of law that is unbending. But if the application of the law results in unkindness, however unintended or regretted, then this should be considered bad law and should be altered, even if it is the law of Moses or the canon law or the word of the ecclesiastical courts or the various codes or the books of concord or practice. However, our ecclesial communities define their rules. Thank you. Thank you. It's so moving to hear Glenn's voice through that. Thank you. Really. To so many of us in the room, I can see names popping up who know and love Glenn, and it's uh, lovely for us to hear him. One of the questions that isn't known is who wrote this book <laughs> and when. Um, and um, one scholarly opinion is that it might have been written around the time of Nehemiah when Nehemiah, who we sometimes call the patron saint of sectarianism, was saying, if you've come back from Babylon to Jerusalem and you've got a foreign spouse, 
get rid of them. If your children are half foreign, send them away. Have proper local children with local um, proper spouses. And so um, the Book of Ruth about this um, widowed, displaced, Moabite, border crossing woman um, is a profound challenge to that. And it seems like one of the strong opinions with somewhat scholarly consensus is that this text emerged around that time. We don't know from whom. Um, and so there is a strangeness to the text and there's a strangeness to the practice of the experience of God, I suppose, in, um, in this text. So here's a prayer um, written about strangeness. And this book has um, some group discussion questions at the end of each chapter or at the back for each chapter and a prayer as well for each chapter. Um, here's, the, um, here's the prayer. Strange God, you speak from clouds and burning bushes, from donkeys, death and devastating news. You speak through stories of the past made relevant today. You speak through mistakes we make and through the things we do to keep ourselves alive. If the far end of the horizon is no limit to you, then surely neither are we. Ourselves, our lovers, our enemies, those we troll, those we denigrate, those we extol and lift to fame. Whoever you are, speak to us wherever we find ourselves and again and again, plead with us. Open us up with little stories, small surprises that soften our guarded borders because you are the strange voice that speaks from strange places, calling us, strangers all, toward each other and toward a justice that looks like love. Amen. So, Podrick, a, a, a wonderful hour has uh, ended with us hearing you as a poet, as well as a writer. I know being a poet is... Maybe, I don't feel so first vocation, but it's way up there. Um, Christine Edmonds said she was definitely not going to buy another book, but <laughs> <laughs> which is just what we want to hear at the end of a wonderful evening like this. Do visit our virtual bookstall, uh, Borders and Belonging. It's a, it's a slender book, uh, happily uh, divided into six, seven chapters with questions for reflection and the liturgy. So totally perfect for your Lent group um, if you haven't um, settled on a on a book already. Um, it just remains to, uh, to me to thank. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, Bishop Gruden, for being our special guest this evening. And we look forward to your book coming out in August, Cries for Lost Homeland. And poor Drake, many congratulations and our thanks for writing this wonderful book and enabling us to share in its uh, riches and wisdom this evening. Thank you and good night, everybody. Good night.